And now we move on to attorney at law, Joseph Ferretti here. On March the 4th, there was a lawsuit filed by an animal control officer against the Berkeley County Commission, the Sheriff's Department, and some individuals were named as well in this. And I'm going to get to Joe Ferretti now to get uh, into some of the facts of this case. Joe, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, gentlemen. Joe, this goes back to that well-publicized Alley Cat Allies case, which got so much publicity but was uh, dismissed fairly, uh, I I should say uh, quickly, uh, it seemed in the court of public opinion by those who said this was just an organization that was going out for some fundraising publicity and they needed a target, and Berkeley County Sheriff's Department's Animal Control Office was the target. And uh, I don't know... uh, it, that it stayed in the news for too long after that because it seemed like it lost attention just as soon as it grabbed it. Uh, but apparently there's more underneath here, Joe, than uh, initially was believed by people. Well, not only uh, was there a public opinion backlash against that case, Rob, uh, the case was actually dismissed uh, in court by the, uh, the judge uh, sitting in Berkeley County, dismissed the case claiming that the uh, Alley Cat allies lacked standing to bring a lawsuit about the uh, alleged conditions and treatment uh, uh, involving animals at animal control. So, and I, that is on appeal, and I'm not sure what the status of the appeal is right now. But this lawsuit that we're talking about this morning, filed by former animal control officer Sherry Farmer, concerns her reporting about conditions at the animal control offices and the treatment of animals in that office. And she alleges in her lawsuit that she was at first disciplined by the sheriff at the time, Nate Harmon and Captain Ron Gardner, another member of the Bergen County Sheriff's Department, and ultimately then was discharged due to some testimony she provided uh, in a dog bite case that she investigated in Berkeley County and also based upon her reporting, continued reporting of her concerns regarding the operations at the animal control. Joe, uh, was she seeking protection under whistleblower laws as part of this suit, or is this uh, separate from that? No, her her lawsuit uh, involves two legal claims. One is the West Virginia whistleblower law, which uh, really acts as an encouragement for employees to come forward when they are concerned about uh, matters uh, at work that may involve uh, illegality or violations of West Virginia public policy. Uh, Workers do have protections if they come forward and make complaints and are subsequently disciplined or discharged. The other basis for her lawsuit is a public policy violation. It's commonly called a harless action uh, from a 1982 case, Harless versus, uh, I think it was Fairmont National Bank. And in that case, uh, that employee came forward about uh, concerns about things going on and, and that uh, with her employer. She was discharged, and uh, the case uh, has stood for the proposition that when employees come forward, either under a whistleblower status or if you're a public employee, civil servant, you come forward and with allegations about how there's waste, fraud, or abuse uh, on the job, you do have protections. It's, it's an exception to the at-will employment status that most West Virginians have on their job. Uh, it is illegal to fire an employee who comes forward with such information. And if that employee is able to prove their case, uh, they can be reinstated to their job they can receive back pay and the loss of benefits that they incurred, and they'll get their attorney's fees paid if they're successful. She is naming the Berkeley County Commission, then Sheriff Nate Harmon, Captain Gardner, and also the current sheriff, Rob Blair. How does he fit into this equation? He, he, uh, he only fits in based upon the fact that he is the current acting sheriff for Berkeley County. And if you're going to sue the entity, uh, you name the person at the top. So there's no specific allegations involving Sheriff Blair other than the fact that uh, by status he is the sheriff today. And so if you're going to shoot through the sheriff's department, you have to name an individual as part of that lawsuit, and that's why he's named. Bill, former president of the Berkeley County Commission. Uh, Joe, I, 
assume all these individuals are protected, billed by the county's insurance in terms of uh, civil damage? Yes, they are, yes. A little bit of history with the uh, uh, animal control. Uh, for several years, uh, it was under the county commission itself, uh, and they had to use, if they had a case that required law enforcement, they had to re uh, recruit a sh deputy to go with them. Uh, I think in 2000, 2001, something like that, uh, uh, they made the decision to move it from the county commission to the sheriff's office. Uh, and that makes some sense because then they had a uh, formal relationship between the uh, animal control and the uh, the deputies. Uh, and it's been kind of a, uh, uh, a uneven relationship ever since then. Uh, some of the sheriffs have embraced animal control. Others have not. Others felt it was a dry, uh, drain on their resources. So they have not been as, uh, as cooperative as what the animal control folks think they should be. But in this particular case, Joe, reading, uh, reading the charge uh, very rapidly, is it primarily a unlawful uh, uh, deter uh, relief of duty, firing, or was it actually some of the specific issues uh, under that animal control, the sheriff's office did uh, uh, with the animal control that she is charging as the basis of her complaint? Yeah, yeah. It, her claim is based upon her uh, discipline at first. Uh, she was given three days off without pay and then her subsequent discharge where now she's you know, without a job and not making money. And, and she's claiming she's due her past uh, lost wages, plus the other penalties we talked about. Uh, so her claim is based upon those actions that were directed against her. The, but underlying all this bill, you're correct, is, is the. Uh, concerns about the conditions at animal control. She alleges that she was reporting concerns about how medication was improperly administered to animals, how they were not treated well, uh, animals that were sick and in need of a veterinarian uh, visit or care were instead euthanized. Uh, and, and these were a lot of the concerns that that Alley Cat Allies group had raised when they filed their lawsuit. And so it, that all ties together. Uh, she is now just claiming that she was retaliated against because she also was reporting similar concerns. And instead of, uh, again, her allegations are instead of remedying the problem, they decided to discharge her. Hey, Joe, if, <clears throat> does this set up an obligation for the county to show that her, that her allegations were groundless? And if so, does, does that then negate all of this? Yeah, it's a good question, John, because the defenses that are available to both Berkeley County Commission and the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department are to establish that there were independent, unrelated grounds for her dismissal and that these concerns about the operations at animal control uh, were, you know, not not just a pretext here. Uh, that they, they And so it's going to be inevitable that some of those allegations regarding animal control are going to come to light and they're going to be evaluated and investigated in this litigation. Uh, but the sheriff's department and the county commission is going to try to establish in defense of this claim that there were independent reasons, maybe job performance, maybe insubordination or something along those lines that really formed the basis for her discharge. Joe, uh, we've had a couple of instances recently, uh, Elaine Malk and Sheriff Harmon and others that had a special prosecutor from outside of the county looking at the facts. Do you anticipate this would fall under the same category of requiring a, spe a special prosecutor? Well, I, I don't know if, the, if an investigation is going to take place that's going to involve a prosecution of anybody. This is a civil case where Sherry Farmer is seeking uh, compensatory damages, and actually injunctive relief. Uh, I'm sure she doesn't want uh, the sheriff's department to give her a bad reference if she's uh, out there applying for new jobs, and that's pro probably part of her injunctive relief request. But this is all going to be on the civil side of things, Bill. Uh, I don't think that there's going to – right now, I don't know if this rises to the concerns that crimes have been committed uh, where people might be prosecuted and 
and a prosecutor would have to come in from outside the area. This isn't all that unusual, I don't think. You know, my, my past life, I was in the safety business. I managed safety programs, and this sort of thing would happen all the time. And I'm not suggesting that this is the case here, that we'll presume that everything is legit and, and all of her claims are, are coming from an honest place. But it was not unusual for employees who uh, suddenly were sniffing the air and realized that their jobs were in jeopardy to real quick uh, come up with and, and report a safety violation, and then they would get fired and then would say that they were fired because they reported the safety violation at, as, as a means to, to save their jobs. Then it became incumbent upon the employer to say, no, 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 that's not why you were fired. You were fired because of all these other things, and it goes into the, the record-keeping requirement that, that employers need to keep good records on, on their, their employees' performance. Uh, so this, in general, th this pattern of, of employee action is, is not extraordinary, at least not in my in my experience no it's not extraordinary uh, I, I can uh, assure you there are instances as you raise where, where employees quickly figure out that a way to save their job perhaps is to is to uh, bring up concerns uh, that would arguably fall under the whistleblower law and provide them some protection against a discharge but I can also tell you as uh, a, par a law partner to two attorneys who did employment law exclusively there are many cases out there where employees do raise very valid concerns regarding workplace issues that uh, would certainly be in the public interest. And when they are discharged as a result, uh, they do have a case and they bring it forward. And the burden falls in on the employer to establish that there are legitimate reasons for the discharge. And this is where employers can get in trouble if they don't keep files and records regarding uh, employee performance and concerns arising from that performance in the past. If they can't establish that there was an ongoing pattern of poor performance that resulted in a discharge, then it, it's more likely going to look like it was a retaliatory discharge due to some uh, concerns regarding uh, public policy matters. The plaintiff is asking for lost wages and benefits, past and future inclusive of front pay, Compensatory damages for humiliation, embarrassment, mental anguish, and loss of enjoyment of life in the past and into the future. Attorney's fees and expenses incurred. Punitive and exemplary damages or and or. Uh, an injunction precluding defendants from taking any additional retaliatory action against the plaintiff directly or indirectly. And any and all other damages, both legal and equitable, along with such other relief as are allowable by law. Joe, are there caps in the state of West Virginia as to what this award could be? I know there was a lot of uh, tort reform that was done by Republicans once they took over the majority in the legislature. Yeah, the only caps that would come into play here are on the punitive damages. Uh, punitive damages are uh, can be sought whenever there's a claim that the, the defendant acted with uh, willfulness and or recklessness or or with conscious disregard for the rights of others and in this particular case of course uh if they're if the plaintiff's able to prove retaliation uh that certainly could qualify as conscious disregard for the rights of others uh and it would be considered somewhat outrageous conduct and then punitive damages could be considered by a jury those are uh pretty much by case law have been capped uh where Punitive damages uh, are usually at just a, a small multiple of the general damages that were awarded by a jury. So, for example, if compensatory jam damages are X, punitive damages could be no more than two or three X. Uh, and, and that's been uh, in the, play, the law in West Virginia now for quite some time. Uh, so there, there's, in general, a cap on those kinds of damages. But otherwise, compensatory damages or whatever the, the employee who's been aggrieved whatever she can prove uh, in, in terms of like her lost wages. You, that's simply a, a calculation uh, effort. Uh, and uh, the general damages uh, in, in, in this kind of case are not capped. So the jury seems inclined to award her for the embarrassment and the anguish of losing a job. Uh, you know, those, those numbers can be determined by a jury without any caps. Joe, can you explain the difference in the burden of proof in a civil case versus a criminal case? Yeah, uh, two two uh, phrases to, uh, to to discuss there, Rob. One is in a civil case, it's preponderance of the evidence. So oftentimes when I tried a case, I stood in front of a jury and I, I put my hands out and I said, if the evidence uh, 
but offered by the plaintiff outweighs even in the slightest the evidence and proof offered by the defense, then the plaintiff should win the case. Uh, in a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, a much more stringent standard for the prosecution to meet. Uh, that's where any reasonable doubt that a jury has about the accused uh, guilt uh, could preponderate in favor of that accused and could result in a defense verdict. So prosecutor has a, a much higher burden of proof, as it should, given that we're talking about the deprivation of liberty uh, involved in criminal cases. Joe, the uh, charges are obviously written for uh, the legal community, and reading through it, I find somewhat difficult to to judge the relative merits. Uh, in this case, do you think there there are merits to uh, uh, that conceivably a, a guilty verdict would would ensue? Uh, the only thing I can uh, interpret from the complaint, Bill, is that there are plenty of factual. Uh, statements offered. It, it reads rather long, and there's a lot of assertions of fact in the complaint, which tells me that the plaintiff's attorney and the plaintiff in this case, Sherry Farmer, are confident that they have the information to establish those facts. You would you would be a little shy about alleging things that you're you're not sure you can prove, but in this case, the complaint is uh, is very extensive. And in terms of its factual recitation. And uh, that tells me there's some confidence on their side that they're going to be able to establish a lot of things that they allege. Well, the burden of proof on, on the plaintiff go to on this date, this action occurred on this particular cage to this particular animal. Does it, does it rise to that level? Does she have to prove these, these kinds of events? Yeah. What typically the exercise will be, John, to, for a judge and jury to kind of categorize uh, those things. So, for example, she talks a lot about the investigation of a dog bite incident in Berkeley County, and the question arose as to whether or not the dog should be euthanized. She alleges that uh, uh, Ron Gardner and the sheriff came forward, and they basically ordered her to euthanize the dog, even though she didn't think that her investigation supported such a conclusion. And so there was a disagreement there. So in, in regards to those facts and circumstances surrounding that dog bite incident, uh, it will be her burden to establish by a preponderance of the evidence that what she is alleging is true. And if she fails to establish even one or two facts of that whole group of facts regarding that incident and that investigation, a jury will be instructed that then they can find in favor of the uh, – the sheriff's department and the Berkeley County commission on that count. And so, uh, yeah, she'll have that burden of establishing a lot of those facts and circumstances that she alleges resulted in her discharge. Chair, this will go before judge McLaughlin. Any comments on uh, what type of, uh, judge judge McLaughlin is in regards to these types of cases? Well, I, I have not had a, a dog bite case in front of Judge McLaughlin, but when I've appeared in front of her, uh, I found her, uh, and Colin will be happy to hear this, I found her to be very even-handed, uh, very fair, uh, and very knowledgeable. Uh, because of her former background as a prosecuting attorney in Morgan County, I think she'll be well in tune with uh, some of the facts and allegations in this lawsuit, too. She'll understand very well how a Berkeley County commission and a Berkeley County uh, sheriff's department would operate uh, involving animal control. And I, I, so I think uh, she, she would, uh, if, if of all the judges in the area, I think she'd be one of those that uh, I think both attorneys would be happy to be assigned to because of her background and experience. All right, Joe, any final comments or thoughts on this uh, case as it moves forward? Well, it's an interesting case. I think it bears watching. Uh, I've reached out to the attorney who filed the lawsuit. His name's Jeff Holmstrand. He's from Wheeling. Uh, I, I think I met Jeff in another life uh, when I used to practice over in that part of the state. And uh, I'm, if I get some comments from him, Rob, or if he uh, desires to talk a little bit more about the lawsuit, uh, I'll certainly uh, set that up with you. Appreciate it, Joe. Have a great day. Good job. Okay, fellas. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.